Okay. Hello and welcome to the very first video of our series of conversations on youth participation, a series of discussions with experts around youth political participation, youth activism and youth rights in times of crises. Today, we're very happy to be launching this series uh, with Dr. Kostis Kornetis from the University of Sheffield. Dr. Kornetis, hello and welcome. Hi, I'm happy to be with you. Great. Um, so you are a teaching associate in uh, modern European history at the University of Sheffield, and you have been doing some extensive work around youth political action and youth making history in specific European contexts. And most recently, you have uh, collaborated in an exhibition around restless youth, focusing on youth um, activism and, and youth participation in making history. Uh, from 1945 until today. Um, I'm sure that your perspective as a, as a historian on this topic of youth participation will be very valuable to our users. So thank you for being with us. Thank you. And um, also to take part in this discussion with us, uh, we have two colleagues from the European Free Alliance and the European Free Alliance Youth, Diane and Valentina. Hello and welcome. Hello. So, Dejan, you are a political advisor for the European Free Alliance, uh, prior to which you have worked in the European Parliament, and you are yourself uh, involved um, as an activist in the Welsh independence movement, and you have been for several years. As such, you were also part of the youth branch of, uh, of FIFA um, previously. Valentina, you are the president of the European Free Alliance Youth, you are Catalan, but you are currently living and working in Scotland and involved in the Young Scots for Independence. Thank you both for taking part in this discussion. And our first question to you, Dr. Cornetis, comes from Dejan from the European Free Alliance. Uh, thank you, and uh, thank you to you as well, uh, Dr. Cornetis, for agreeing to take part. Um, now, my question is, um, so the measures taken by governments all across Europe uh, to try and contain the pandemic, such as uh, restricting freedom of movement, for example, um, this might affect our lives and how we interact with each other for some time to come. Um, however, things like uh, demonstrations of youth movements or youth international events or gatherings have been really vital in um, consolidating these campaigns or increasing engagement, making an impact, uh, and so on. Uh, now, these are things that are probably not going to be allowed to happen uh, in the same way anytime soon. So, do you think that these restrictions um, of this type, the freedom of movement and so on, will this affect um, youth movements and their effectiveness and you think maybe it could even lead to a, a step back uh, in terms of youth engagement? Thank you very much for this uh, for this question, Day. And so let me start from uh, uh, a uh, an incident in in Greece. Uh, the the uh, communist youth organization called CNE. Uh, it gathered in the very central Syntagma Square on the, on the first of May for the first of May parade, and that might come as a surprise to you, but the way in which they did it was exemplary. So, the, you know, they kept distances and they wore masks. Uh, it, I really recommend that you look at an image of that because it was really spectacular. Um, however, I think that there is something military or militaristic about this uh, discipline, which normally does not characterize, you know, such youth, uh, youth groups. You know, may, maybe a Stalinist element is obvious there. So, you know, maybe that's not exactly the way forward. I, I use it a little bit uh, anecdotally. Uh, now, um, to, to, to be more serious, I do believe that these restrictions will have long term consequences on, on youth movements, especially. especially if uh, if there will be a second wave of uh, of the epidemic, of the pandemic, uh, with another wave of, of measures, of course, possibly even more restrictive than uh, the previous one. What is 
lost right now uh, is, I think, a very tangible and corporeal element in the movements, you know, the proximity of bodies, the very physicality of street activism, marching together and so on. So uh, in effective or emotional terms um, as well, the, the price is, is very high right now for people who are ready to go out in the streets. However, um, uh, I'm thinking about the uh, repressive systems uh, of the past, the violent pasts. I'm, I'm, I've worked on the Greek and the Spanish and the Portuguese dictatorships in the 20th century, uh, but I'm also thinking about Latin America or Southeast Asia, uh, where under restrictive regimes, social movements were banned from public from the public sphere for a long time. We know that the moment grievances come to a maximum the structure of feeling that characterizes social movements and youth movements comes back with a vengeance. So, in other words, I do think movements will suffer for a bit, but they are an organic element in the body politic in modern liberal democracies, and they will no doubt reappear, reinforced sooner, um, sooner or later. Oh, thank you very much. It's a really uh, interesting answer. Um, I particularly enjoyed how you talked about how the the physicality you know of of democracy the de democratic process we always think about you know big crowds of people listening to speeches and even the act of casting a ballot itself is a uh, physical thing so um yeah plenty to think about there uh, thank you very much and i give the floor now to valentina hello professor and um, thanks so much for for answering these questions for us and for taking your time um, when compared to the youth of the 70s or 80s, it seems like today's youth, our generation, is less mobilized and has less conscience of what we could be achieving through protest and activism. Some may say that new ways of communication and especially social media enable us to be more informed and to organize ourselves in previously unseen ways. Yet it seems like it's almost making activism more virtual and less active in the streets. Online activism can make people feel as if they are politically active, meaning that they don't take further steps to go out and demonstrate and get involved politically. What are your thoughts about this evolution in our youth activism? Well, thank you for this question, Valentina, and, and for making the link with, with uh, the, the 70s uh, and the, the juxtaposition to, to, to previous generations. I think this generation now is much more heterogeneous and much more you know, plural or pluralist. Uh, in any case, I believe um, that what's, you know, what you are referring at is the logical continuation of activism already having turned to some extent digital in the previous years. So I'm thinking about the fact that social media were involved in the development of the Arab Spring and the Indignados movements in, in Spain and Greece, Israel, Chile, and elsewhere. Of course, the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement in the US. So um, these were seen as, as game changers, the dynamic game changers in, in terms of contentious politics, the extensive use of new technologies and the global nature of these movements, right? thinking globally, acting locally, were cited as a proof of that. Um, uh, several um, theories like, like Jennifer Earle and Katrina Kimports, they talked of a digital repertoire of contention and Lance Bennett about connective action so in a way, uh, we were already there, but of course now, you know, this is an extra step. So, you know, going fully digital. So I don't believe that cyber activism, uh, on the other hand, can replace physical gatherings. Um, in fact, if there is something that we can learn uh, from the current Black Lives Matter movement uh, in the U.S. is that even under the present day dramatic circumstances, uh, a movement involving grassroots street activism can erupt anytime. And it is a movement, uh, again, the Black Lives Matter movement with uh, uh, surprising transnational characteristics and, and potential. So we see graffiti with George Floyd and uh, on the walls of Exarchia in Athens now, young 
high school students in silent protest in many different countries in Europe. So there is an element of identification that what is going on in the U.S. does affect them too, which is spectacular, and it brings people out in the streets. So I think Black Lives Matter can be a game changer, uh, probably because also because it's about racism, right? So that it, that makes it universal. It's a universal uh, issue of um, of protest. So exactly the point where we were thinking that we might turn fully digital. I think Black Lives Matter, you know, comes back and brings back uh, the the uh, the physicality of of movements out in the in the streets, despite everything, despite the danger, um, despite safety concerns. You know, people burst out. So I, I find this really, um, you know, really impressive. Yes, I completely agree. I think um, what we're going to see now in the future is a hybrid, like the Fridays for Climate Change. And, and as you said, the Black Lives Matter movement has shown us that a mix of social media and still taking the streets to protest is possible. And we're taking both sides to make sure we achieve as much people as possible. But thank you so much for your time and for answering our questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I also have a, a question now regarding more the economy. Um, so the European Commission has recently says that it expects a serious shrink of the European Europe's economy in 2020. Um, and some observers are actually saying now that this might be the deepest recession that the Union has known since its creation. Uh, and I think we can re reasonably expect that this will affect uh, young people, especially um, their access to employment and to stable employment um, in the near future. Um, looking back on Europe's history in, in what you have studied, how would you say that the state of the economy usually affects youth participation? And do you think that the current context and the cur current contest of, of uh, recession will lead to new demands from the youth um, emerging. Thank you um, for, for this uh, complex question, Julie. So uh, my, my feeling is that, you know, this, this current crisis will affect everyone, and especially the youth in terms of employment opportunities. I expect, um, uh, I've, been, I've been reading the, the White Book of the European Commission, uh, some time ago, which was reporting uh, that there is a risk that every new generation of young people uh, will live worse than their parents in the European Union. So research opportunities, scholarships, youth investment, etc., will be cut in the aftermath or the continuation, if you like, of the COVID crisis. So we're fa facing a very serious um, uh, problem of, of in terms of redistribution among generations. So. Um, this problem, you might say, has been going on for, for decades. It's not new, but the current crisis uh, is just exacerbating it. We might see a broad affair between the 35-year-olds, uh, you know, currently unemployed, versus the younger cohorts, fresh out of the studies, looking for a job. Now, being Greek and having lived in Spain for some time, I'm, I have experienced the previous economic crisis of 2009, which was a big shock. So the lessons learned from, from, from this is that uh, what will happen in societal terms depends on how solid institutions and political systems and welfare and labor markets are and how they're going to respond to this incredible challenge. And I'm afraid that, you know, the challenges, uh, changes and challenges will stay with us. Now, um, one element that I, I foresee is disaffection, disaffection and uh, uh, political malaise. Uh, these are to be expected. You know, precarious work uh, uh, or unemployment will reinforce this. Uh, again, pre-existing tendencies. Uh, precarity, for example, pre-existed the, the COVID crisis, but it will no doubt rise as a result of, uh, of this. So uh, it remains to be seen to what extent this uh, political malaise will going to fuel radicalization and street protests. I remember reading some surveys with young people uh, a couple of years ago uh, in France, around the time of the Nuit de Bure uh, movement, showing that a relatively high percentage of youngsters agreed with the fact that political violence 
in French society can be justified. Not, not all of them, but in a survey on radicalism, that was a survey, 20% of young w- were justifying violence in politics. Now here, of course, you have local issues, uh, angry young men and women in, in the French banlieues, and etc. But still 20% is very high. Uh, Protest traditions also also play a role in how young people will respond to these challenges. For instance, France, again, rates high in this respect of, you know, having a a pedigree of social mobilization. Greece as well. Tariq Ali uh, once said that uh, if uh, Michelin stars existed for protest movements, France would get five stars and Greece probably four. So, you know, this is just to show that uh, traditions matter. On the other hand, there are other factors that, that play a role. Uh, for instance, the degree of social protection in each country. German or French social protection is much wider than Spanish, Portuguese, or Greek, for example. Right. So I think this is going to, to, to be part um, of the mix. Well, I'm not trying to say that wherever there is social protection, there are no movements. There is no monocausal explanation of movements. We saw recently, Valentina mentioned the Extinction Rebellion in the UK. The general environmental movement also blossomed in Germany, for example, which has social protection. So, uh, you know, it's it, it can be, it can, it varies and can be blended. But uh, I think we're going to deal with a new political generation here. Uh, which is going to be forged out of this uh, unique uh, uh, political and economic situation. This generation will experience the double dramatic consequences of environmental crises and the economic crises caused by the epidemic. Um, Long-term consequences, again, um, until recently in terms of cohorts, uh, it was people between 26 and 34 uh, which were, who were the ones who got more active politically, um, this might change now. So even the younger ones, between 18 and 25, uh, they might find political opportunities or new mobilizing structures because of all this traumatic situation. Now, um, so one expectation is high levels of political involvement uh, among young people. On the other hand, and uh, we've seen that in places with high unemployment in the past, like Spain, political um, apathy and cynicism, you know, a dropout tendency in the 1970s uh, in, in Spain, this was, uh, this was called disaffection or uh, desencanto. Uh, it, you know, this tends to emerge among young people in precarious situations, you know, people who feel frustrated and un- unable to, to express their grievances to redress the situation. You know, the idea is, you know, why bother? Um, but again, I don't think that we're going to that direction. I believe that the, the situation is going to be so explosive uh, that it will offer enough incentives uh, even to these uh, youngsters to participate politically uh, as well, you know, even to, to the very frustrated ones. Um, uh, of course, you know, there are other variables, so the intergenerational transmission of, of interest in politics, for example, you know, what noise families make about it, uh, what kind of political lessons they transmit about their past in the 70s, in the 60s, in the 80s, and so on. People behave differently in terms of mobilization, depending on how close or distant they are from their parental political status. And, you know, I just wanted to, to mention that the legacy of the parental background, it plays a role. And finally, if I can, if, if I can add um, just a couple of things, I think we should think of the long durée consequence of all this, you know, not just the uh, short durée of imminent political action. In historical sociology, there is the so-called long- longitudinal approach. Uh, so unemployment, for instance, is something that you carry with you um, even after many years, even after you, you, you know, probably find a job. The fear, uh, the uncertainty, the feeling that nothing is stable, you know, you cannot look at the future with a perspective. According to some um, German data, um, again, longitud- long- longitudinal, uh, being unemployed when young has effects in the political involvement uh, and the general political outlook uh, of a person uh, in one's future life, you know, this kind of feeling of, of fragility. So, again, we should think about the long durée um, of this. Uh, having said all this, it is difficult to, for, to foresee with precision what's going to happen. Uh, as I said before, 
uh, to Valentina. I think young people uh, today are much more heterogeneous than in the past. Um, uh, you know, they don't have this kind of standardized life course that we had in the past. They're more plural there than their their parents. Uh, but I think we're going to see some very interesting things. Uh, a very final coda to this, since we're dealing with Brussels and the European Union, I believe that affective identification with Europe might also suffer a lot. I don't want to say that it will collapse, but it might suffer as um, as a result of all this. Thank you very much for this elaborate um, answer. Um, coming from France, I um, definitely understand what you're saying about also the radicalization that might happen um, in some sections of the population um, when times are difficult. And um, I think we can only hope that um, even with social movements um, radicalizing a bit and demands being so radical, our institutions and governments will be responsive to it um, in another way than just responding with violence themselves. Um, so I really hope this. Um, well, I think this concludes our conversation today. Uh, thank you all very much for your participation and most import importantly, thank you, Dr. Cornetis, for your, for your time and for, for accepting to taking part um, in, this, uh, in this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Diane and Valentina. Thank you for having me. Thanks. And uh, thank you to our viewers for watching this video. We hope you have found this conversation interesting. And our next video conversation will be released in July and will take place with uh, Sotfa Daji, who works with young women activists. Until then, take care and goodbye.